So I'm recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wallpaper and Ephemeral Art with decorative arts historian Elsie Hireman Klumpner. We're so happy to have you here, Elsie, to give this fascinating talk on a subject we don't get to discuss very often. So it, sh it should be interesting. Before we get started, I wanted to tell folks about what we have coming up. Um, our summer schedule just came out. Um, as many of you had joined us for the Silver Spring Blues Week last month, and now we are in full swing into our summer schedule, which is still virtual, but with some select in-person events including the return of Twilight Tuesdays. So every Tuesday evening, we will have a performance on Veterans Plaza. We are kicking off next Tuesday, 5 to 8 p.m. It's a new time. It's an extra hour, 5 to 8 p.m. with um, TV John and the Legendary Band. Um, this month, we have an interesting mix of programs that are tied to the theme of paper. And so kicking off the month of July is Elsie's program about wallpaper. And then a week from tonight, we have paper conservation at the National Portrait Gallery, 1988 through 2017, and the Smithsonian's broader commitment for preserving cultural heritage with paper conservator. Rosemary Fallon, who is an SSTCI board member. And then on Monday the 19th, we have our art salon and the theme is putting it on paper, sketching, doodling, making notes, capturing ideas at the start of the creative process. And that's hosted by another board member, uh, Lauren Lay. Um, and that's our art salon is for everyone from along the creative spectrum, artists, musicians, poets, writers, and anyone who would like to share um, their work and their creative process. And then we have um, a tiny house tour exploring the magic and mystery created with paper mache mixed media memories and imagination. And that is hosted by artist Marcy Wolf Hubbard. In fact, Elsie and I know each other through one of Marcy's uh, mixed media classes, virtual classes that we we've been taking throughout the pandemic. Um, so this tiny house um, tour is really just a, a share of people who've made tiny houses and will tell the stories behind their houses. It's actually quite interesting to delve into uh, and you might consider taking a tiny house workshop with us, which we will be hosting uh, during the colder season with Marcy. And then our featured artist this month is a paper artist, um, and that's going to be Monday, July 26th, Art of the Art of Paper Making in the studio with Christina King. And then on uh, July 28th, Wednesday, we have an origami workshop with folks from the, the nonprofit group Suru for Solidarity. And that is um, three origami are um, origami experts from Suru for Solidarity: um, Jerry Honda, Jun Hana, Hamamoto, and Mari Matsumoto, and they will be leading the workshop in origami. So that should be fascinating. Suru for Solidarity is a, a wonderful organization that um, that safeguards the memory of, of what happened um, during the Japanese internment um, and so that it never happens again. So they're really a wonderful group. I hope you can join us for that. Um, all, all, of our, all of our events are made possible with generous support from Montgomery County, United Therapeutics, the Arts and Humanities of Montgomery County, Maryland State Arts, and many others. And now, Let's get started with the program wallpaper and ephemeral art, Elsie or an ephemeral beauty it also is. So Elsie Hireman Klumpner earned a master's degree from the Smithsonian Parsons program in the history of decorative arts in 2003. 
Her special interests are the history of furniture, the history of wall coverings, jewelry making and mixed media art. In 2010, she taught a course in the history of wallpaper for graduate students enrolled in the master's degree program from the Smithsonian Parsons program in the history of decorative arts. Color and pattern are her passions. And she lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with her husband, Jim, and their dog, Walter. So great to have you, Elsie. Thank Please you. take it away. Yeah, well, thank you, Lisa. That was a very nice introduction. And thank you for asking me to do this. Um, so I'm going to jump right into uh, the presentation. And I think it would probably work best if we took questions at the end. So hang on to your questions. Um, welcome. I'm so glad you're interested in wallpaper. We're going to take a, a wild ride through the history of wallpaper. Trying to do it in an hour is a challenge, uh, which will be fun. We'll define wallpaper and review its history from its origins in the 15th century through modern day examples and uses. So the way we define wallpaper um, is it is pieces of paper decorated with ink or paint used to line the walls of interior spaces. That's a pretty broad um, definition. Today, wall wallpaper products are made of many materials, not just paper. In fact, some of them are made with no paper involved. Um, and we'll use the word, but we will use the words um, wallpaper and wall coverings to describe them all. We'll use it interchangeably. Wall coverings is the more modern term, um, but it's still wallpaper to me. So um, on the slide right now, we see two examples of wallpaper um, from very different eras. The image on the left is Blackthorn, that's the name of the pattern. It was designed in 1892 by John Henry Durrell, an arts and crafts movement designer in England. Um, so Blackthorn was designed by Durrell, it was made by the Jeffrey Company um, in England and would, was made with, uh, as a color woodblock on paper. And we'll talk about some of these terms as we go along. On the right hand side, the cow wallpaper. Um, this is always a fun one to look at because it's unusual. It was designed by Andy Warhol in 1966. Um, it's a screen print on vinyl, so there's no paper involved there. Um, and he was not a professional wallpaper designer, but he designed all kinds of prints. And so he, um, designed this cow wallpaper. He liked to um, kind of play on modern consumer choices and images, and that's what this is. I don't know if it was ever used to really wallpaper a room. It was shown in an exhibit for sure. So, so we're going to start early. Um, this slide will show us the oldest existing evidence of wallpaper, which is dated 1509. And on the left hand side, you see the fragments, the front and or fragment front and back. And on the right hand side, you see a contemporary recreation of that fragment. Originally, wallpaper was fragile and ephemeral inks and paints faded over time and papers deteriorated. Bugs ate the glue used to mount them. Wallpapers hung on interior walls um, and were susceptible to wear and tear, as they still are. Unlike many decorative furnishings, wallpaper is ephemeral. It's often removed, it's papered over, it's painted over. Um, it's scraped off. It was not valued in the same way as other decorative arts like furniture um, and textiles and silver. There are exceptions to that, but everyday wallpaper was not considered something that you were going to pass down to your heirs in the way you might a, a good piece of furniture. So the scrap that we're looking at is the oldest example that we have from 1509. In 1911, um, 
It was found during a redecoration of the Lodge of Christ College in Cambridge, um, a 15th century building. And someone found it and was um, smart enough to tell somebody and save what they could. Um, the images on the left, as I said, show the front and the reverse of the, the design. And on the right is the recreation. So this is the very oldest one we know about that may not remain. We might find our wallpapers that are earlier, but um, this is a very early piece. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about who it was who invented wallpaper as we know it. Um, in early, early centuries, Chinese craftsmen invented paper and their paper making skills spread around the world. Um, in Europe, paper stainers made the first papers made to be mounted on walls as early as the 13th and 14th centuries. We'll talk later about what forms these papers took. Here we're looking at Jean-Michel Papillon, who lived in the 17th and 18th century. And he is given credit as being the inventor of wallpaper as we know it now. Um, and we'll talk about how he did that. He, um, he invented the first repeating designs that matched on both sides. He also developed a method of joining small printed sheets together. Originally, paper was, was uh, all pieces of paper were small. They were handmade and they were, they were small, but he figured out a way to join them into lengths so they could be hung on a paper, I mean, on a wall. Um, and that was the continuous role. So his innovations made it possible to cover interior walls completely. So we see him on the left and on the right, we see a fragment of a French paper, which is called a papier de tapisserie, designed by him and made in his Paris workshop. It's a wood block printing and a counterproof, which means that the pattern is built up symmetrically in both directions on the basis of four sheets of paper. Four sheets of paper, which meet at, at the darker rosette in the center. The upper left and lower right sheets are prints taken directly from the same block. The two other sheets are counterproofs, which means the reverse, so that you see the entire pattern. So the way that early wallpapers were made was using wood blocks, wood block printing. The earliest wallpapers were produced using wood block, wood block printing. To print designs, wood blocks were deeply carved with each element of the design. The surface of the block was inked and the block was lowered onto a handmade paper to imprint the design. The process was repeated for each element of the design. Complex designs required many blocks in order to complete them, 30, 40, 50 sometimes. The process was laborious and time consuming, but until the 19th century, this was the only method that existed. Um, Papillon's son, J.M. Papillon, published illustrations of many of the wallpaper processes used in his father's workshop. For years, these images illustrated the early production processes for designers and craftsmen. And he illustrated many, many, many types of industries. Um, so the top register here on the left shows some tools that were used. Uh, the lower registers show color mixing, inking the wood block, preparing the paper, making the impression with the wood block, and hanging newly printed sheets to dry. Um, so, so, before Papillon's innovation, small sheets of handmade paper called domino papers were produced in France beginning in France. The makers were called Domino Tears, the maker of brocade papers of all kinds of colored and printed papers. The sheets were small, 
about 18 by 20 inches, limited by the size, um, it, limited in size by the papers, paper maker's mold. So that's why the papers were so small. When paper technology improved and paper could be made larger, then that was a good thing for wallpaper. These domino papers were printed in black ink and sometimes enhanced with stencil colors. There were designs um, of religious icons, heraldic designs, um, someone's coat of arms, and woodcuts. This example was hung on a pulpit in a church, and it's a religious icon. Um, perhaps the, the two faces of the men at the upper right and left are patrons of the church. Um, and you see a border around the, the central medallion that is um, imitation wood graining. So that was one of the things that wallpaper did was imitate. So domino papers were also used, uh, some went on the walls, some were used to line storage boxes um, or cabinets. And here we see two engravings of advertisements for domino papers. Um, let's see. They both show makers uh, wearing a garment made up of sample, sample domino sheets. And this is the way they would advertise them and let people know what was available. Um, in the left-hand figure with the woman with the, the dress, in the very background, you can see women who are making the domino papers. So, and the one, the image on the right is a domino lining paper, probably used to line a box or a cabinet. Um, and it may also have been hung on an interior wall. And here we are with two more domino papers. These both were um, domino papers used as lining paper. Um, their form, the one on the left is a formal design. It's a woodblock print. Um, and the one on the right is the same, about 1600 uh, dated. So in, following these early efforts to make papers that had meanings and were meant to hang on walls. During the 17th and 18th centuries, we come across the golden age of wallpaper in England and France. They were the two leaders in developing the technologies um, and designing the patterns and producing wallpaper. Other countries did, um, but the, the examples that were that were really outstanding came from those two countries. In the 17th and 18th centuries um, in France and England, a wide range of designs were produced on joined lengths of paper. Wallpapered interiors were appealing to much of the population and designs became more sophisticated and followed decorative trends and fashions. So we see on the left, a fragment of a wallpaper um, from France. It's a color wood block print, and it has um, an Etruscan vase in it, some classical motifs, flowers, doves. And so that would have been a beautiful paper. On the right-hand side, another floral wallpaper with classical elements. Um, made in France by an Italian designer in the Revillon workshop. Revillon is not something, someone I'm going into deeply, but he was another person like Papillon who had a very um, terrific uh, and wonderful workshop where he designed and made wallpapers. The golden, golden age of wallpaper in England. In England, floral designs and colorful 
of designs with historical and cultural references were very popular. Um, so we have some images here. The one in the upper left is a design for a wallpaper panel. It shows, um, and it's a design, not the panel itself. Uh, flowers, foliage, buds, blue, blueberries, and the designer was uh, one of the few designer names that we have for that time, John Baptist Jackson. He was well known in England for his designs for um, wallpaper production. And it, this is done in, as a watercolor and pencil on paper. The one on the left um, is a heroic landscape with wa a watering place for riders and an obelisk in the background. He also designed this one, John Baptist Jackson, um, and it's a wood engraving. And the one on the bottom is a wallpaper panel. This is wallpaper. And it has a design featuring a man on a camel talking with a boy with a greyhound dog on a leash in the Chinese style. Um, etchings and hand coloring uh, done on paper. The Chinese style, the Chinese art that was beginning to be imported into um, England and Europe uh, influenced the designs for decorative arts, all kinds of decorative arts, not just wallpaper, furniture and silver designs and all kinds of things. Um, so we don't know who designed this, but this reflects the influence of the Chinese motifs. So. Okay, imitation. One function of wallpapers was simply to decorate walls and provide a background for furnishings. Another important function was to imitate a number of different things, but very much um, imitating luxurious materials, expensive woven tapestries, velvet or brocade fabrics. All of these were used by the wealthy to decorate and insulate their homes but they were um, very costly and out of the reach of the ordinary people. So the lower market clamored for imitations of those things so they could feel that they also were well, had wonderfully decorated homes. And so we see papers that imitate all kinds of things. On the left, um, this is an ornamental design consisting of intertwined flowing lines, um, originally found in Arabic and Moorish decoration. Um, it's des design, the design was inspired by popular fabrics and it's dated to the late 18th century. Um, and the designer's name is Jean-Baptiste Fay, and this is block printed. And on the right-hand side, we see um, another wallpaper that's imitating architectural detail, a pillar and arch pattern, which was very, very popular and often used by people, um, primarily in uh, hallways, in entrance hallways to their, to their homes um, to set a tone for their status. These two are fun. Um, these, both of these are papers that Im imitate tapestry, which is different, a little different than just imitating a fabric. Um, let's see. On the left is a tapestry paper with a border. It's French and it's wood block printed and hand colored. And it's 1760 is the date. Um, they didn't, these paper imitations didn't provide warmth, but they did introduce pattern and color into interiors. And if you look closely, you can see um, the joins and seams. Let's see. Um, there are lines, so there's several blocks. There's probably one, two, three blocks on one side and three blocks on the other and fitted together, they, they make um, a solid scene. The one on the bottom 
it's much more obvious because they don't match up entirely correctly. Um, it's a tapestry of paper. It's printed on single sheets, um, woodblock printed and colored. And this, this wallpaper taken from a Swiss castle is constructed with 12 single sheets of paper, each de depicting one part of the total scene that they wanted to, to show on the wall. And um, it's been removed from its original home. Um, and so perhaps there was some damage to it and that's why we see right down the middle that it doesn't match up exactly right, but it's a beautiful example of what it is. Another thing that wallpaper imitated was velvet. Um, people loved velvet hangings in their homes and the people who couldn't afford that could get these special wallpapers that were called flock wallpapers. And they imitated damask and velvet. Um, I've seen them made and it's very interesting to see the way they're made. Um, let's see. Flocking produced wallpapers that had the look and feel of velvet. It was achieved by laying designs on paper, which were filled with in with adhesive or, or glue. And then they would take a, um, some kind of a container with um, chopped wool and silk fibers, and they would um, shake it over the design. And then when it was dry, they would pick it up, hang it up, and the only place that the um, silk fibers or whatever um, adhered to was where the adhesive was. So that's how this particular wallpaper was made. And you can still find flocks. Um, they're not probably, uh, they're not made exactly that way anymore because they're made by machine, but um, they have a, a nice feel. Uh, you can, the flocking stands out on the paper and you can feel it, see it. So another thing that happened in the, the 18th and 17th and 18th centuries, um, in addition to all the papers and designs that were being um, done in all over Europe and in England and France, uh, the Chinese started exporting wallpaper. Um, not exactly the kind of wallpaper that was being made in Europe and in England, but um, they had these exquisite hand printed papers that were exported, exported by China to the West. And they added to what kind of products were available to really the more wealthy clients. Um, the Chinese pa panels were highly detailed. They were made in sets of 25 to 40 lengths enough to decorate a whole room. Each section had a different design and when hung, hung in sequence, they created a complete unending panorama. These papers were expensive and fairly rare. And this is one case with these that I'm aware of with these Chinese papers, that they were so valued that they were often mounted on um, wooden frames, uh, they were taken with the, the residents when they left that home, they would go to the next one. They would take that pulp paper with them and try to use it again. Or sometimes they rolled it up, but they, they preserved it in a way that other wallpapers were not um, preserved because they were so beautiful. And, and so in this nine panel um, example, you can see trees, flowers, birds, uh, fragments of rocks. These are all very common Chinese motifs um, in their wallpapers. They, they had many natural, naturalistic um, papers. They had papers that depicted Chinese life, different industries in China. Um, so I'd like to have that one in my house. <laughs> okay, so when we get to the 19th century, as we are going along, we get to technological advances, uh, the production advances and 
the most important one is machine printing. By 1800, wallpapers were wildly popular. Manufacturers searched for ways to print more papers quickly and cheaply. During the Industrial Revolution, newly invented machine technology slowly replaced the time-consuming handwork required by the woodblock printing. Wallpapers were made quick, quickly and cost the consumer less. As a result, the wallpaper market widened and only increased as time went on. Printing machines with large cylindrical drums, as we see in this illustration on the, on the left, were able to pick up uh, paints and imprint designs over a, a, continu a long, continuous length of paper in minutes. The multiple colors and design elements were achieved by changing the rollers, one of which you see on the, the right-hand side, until the design was complete. So they still, as they had had to change the wood blocks, they had to change the rollers, but the whole process went much more quickly. Um, and so what resulted in the beginning were not really very high quality papers. Um, the designs of the first machine printed papers would appear thin and a bit colorless. Uh, the, the paint looks thin in comparison to the richer and more complex effects that uh, were seen with block printing. Most designs were simple floral or geometric designs with small repeats. No one could de deny the speed and the economy with which the wallpaper could now be made, but the printing quality had to catch up, which it does. Um, in the introduction in 1830 of a steam powered machinery in wallpaper production lifted Britain's wallpaper output from around 1 million rolls in the year of 1834 to nearly 9 million rolls in 1860. And so the wallpaper manufacturers were happy, the consumers were happy. They were uh, making wallpapers certainly for the wealthy, but also for um, all, all levels of homeowners, all economic groups. Prices dropped in the space of one generation and wallpaper had become a commodity that was available to everybody now. And on the right in particular, you can see if you look at the leaves in the design, the green parts um, and some of the the blue design up at the top. You can see it, it's not very even. Um, you, you tend to see this little shadow of paint at the bottom of the image um, where it has not dried quickly enough and so it, it runs a little bit. But these were the early ones and things get much better later. Okay, so these are improvements. In the 19th century, machine printed papers caught up with the designs and the quality of their predecessors. Um, enhancements to machine or surface printing processes improved the products. And by the mid 19th century, wallpapers were available in a variety of designs, including marble and wood grain, imitation stucco, textile patterns, historical pastiche, uh, revival styles designs to commemorate national events, as well as traditional floral and geometric patterns. On the left, we see uh, the wallpaper pattern, Thorn Damask is its name. Every pattern has a name. This is from 1837, and it was machine printed and a color print from wood blocks. So it was a combination of two methods and probably uh, made by the Jeffrey and, and Company, um, which was a very well-known 19th century wallpaper producer. They produced for all the, the leading designers um, and into the 20th century. On the right-hand side, we see one of these um, commemoration pieces. In the background through the archway, you see the Crystal Palace um, 
This is a color machine print from mid 19th century made by Haywood, Higgin, Botham and Smith. And the Crystal Palace uh, was built in Hyde Park in London to house the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was a celebration of the best of England's technology and art and all kinds of culture. It was the very first of the world's fairs and each of the world's fairs were designed to um, exhibit advances in technology and art and all, and all kinds of things. So that was number one, the first one. Uh, also in the 19th century, we have a class of wallpapers called um, sanitaries. Um, in this case, it's a nursery print. The growing knowledge about germs inspired washable sanitary wallpapers in the 19th century. Papers for kitchens and nurseries were printed using oil-based pigments and producing a washable surface. David Walker's papers were particularly high quality using good paper and a large number of colors. And you can see in this example, uh, there are lots of colors. It's a, a very pretty design, delicate. Um, the colors are, are bright enough and, and, um, and it might've been in a child's room and they could wash it if it got dirty. Before we leave the 19th century, we have to talk about one of the most influ influential designers of, of that century, William Morris. You may have heard of him. Um, he's still well known in the world. He lived in the 19th century, but his designs have lived on. Um, he was a British textile designer. He was a socialist and he was a member of the British arts and crafts movement. He emulated a medieval ideal of craftsmanship where um, a single craftsman had his hand in every step of the design and fabrication process. The arts and crafts movement, William Morris and a number of other um, people um, were reacting to the mechanization of industry and uh, the sameness of the products that were being produced and the specialization of the, pro the, the activities. So they felt that, it had, that design was better back in the days when there was one person who carried out the entire process from design to implementation themselves. Um, These were meant to appeal to the middle class. Morris had very high ideals and felt that he would like to make these um, beautiful papers accessible to everyone, every economic group. It didn't really work out that way. Um, his, his designs were beautiful, they were expensive to produce and they, they needed to cost more money than many people could afford, but that was his intention. Um, it, his patterns still um, are replicated and printed and people use them in interiors um, in this country, in England, probably other places. Um, his designs were really something nice, something beautiful. He produced about 50 wallpaper designs during his lifetime and his success relied on his close observation of nature the papers depict plant-based forms in either a naturalistic or a more formal um, setting or design. And these are the more naturalistic ones, the canthus pattern um, done with wood blocks, the old method, he, was not, he did not use machines to make his wallpapers. The Pimpernel pattern on the right, another very naturalistic, um, beautiful, engaging pattern. Here are uh, two that are a little bit more formal in their presentation, the St. James pattern 
um, and the sunflower pattern. The sunflower pattern is very symmetrical, very formal. Okay. This is a new convention for wall decorations in, that became popular during the 19th century. Um, in the 19th century, as wallpaper production sped up and prices dropped, wallpapers became the most important element in interior decoration. People really wanted to, to um, set off their houses with these backgrounds for all the rest of their furnishings. The repeal of the 124 year old wallpaper tax in England spiked the affordability of wallpapers for all homes. In the 1860s, an innovative arrangement of hanging wallpaper was introduced. Walls were divided into three horizontal sections. Um, the dado, which is the bottom section here, the filler, which is the middle section, and the frieze. Um, now there had been dado um, railings on it in architecture and in, in domestic architecture, um, but this took it a step further. And so the dado was on the bottom, the filler is the middle, and the frieze goes up to the ceiling. Um, three different but complementary papers were used to, to um, carry out the design throughout the room. Um, so, so here we see a dado designed by Bruce Talbert, who was also um, active in the arts and crafts movement. The manufacturer was Jeffrey and Company. And this is a color wood block print. And there is flock. I'm not sure which of the designs has flock flocking on it, but one of them does. So now we're jumping into the 20th century. Um, in the early 20th century and 21st centuries, wallpaper printing methods were modernized, new methods were developed. Surface printing, gravure printing, silk screen and rotary printing were introduced and are used today. All of these things are used today. And patterns changed quickly following artistic and interior decoration trends. Artists and architects and illustrators and industrial designers designed wall coverings. Paper wallpapers were still produced as new substrates, which is what they're printed on. Um, such as solid vinyl or paper backing with a vinyl coating or fabric backing with a vinyl coating were introduced and are still used today. At the same time, traditional wallpaper materials and design designs remain popular, floral stripes, vignettes. Wallpapers, wall coverings were made around the world. In the US, a glut of independent wallpaper manufacturers competed for labor technology and their share of the market. Sears Roebuck marketed wallpapers to many American homes using their popular mail order catalogs. And so here we see a, a page from one of their catalogs from 1912. Um, and each wallpaper provides complementary wallpapers, which we could use together you could um, do the dado filler and freeze arrangement. They all have a name and they give the price of a sheet um, and people would order them through the mail and then have um, wallpaper hangers, put them up if they didn't do it themselves. So traditional floral designs continue. This is 1930 to 1940. Um, one of the, the things about wallpaper is there are no great cutoff dates for designs. Some people like traditional designs that look like they could have been designed and, and produced in the 18th century. And uh, some people would rather have the, the cutting edge, the, the most recent 
kinds of designs and we'll see some of those. But these were two floral side walls. They're just um, lengths of wallpaper made by the Enterprise Wallpaper Company and they're surface machine printed and uh, don't seem to have some of the problems that the early ones did. The colors are vivid enough and um, they're very attractive papers. In the 30s, um, three kinds of patterns were used, vignettes, cultural icons, and nursery themes. Um, let's see, vignettes were introduced. Designs included scenes of islands and lakes, kitchens with miniature shelves and tiny teacups hovering in midair. Designs for children's rooms, including cartoon motifs were popular. In Canada, wallpaper motifs included cultural references, such as the one that we're, we see here, uh, the Mounties, the Canadian Mounties, or igloos or dog sleds. Um, so the vignette pattern is up in the left-hand um, side. And we see this is for a, a, a pretty kitchen and it has urns and cups and flowers dancing around. Um, and kind of a white and gray, uh, very subtle pattern backing that. Um, the Canadian Mounties doesn't need much explanation. We see a Canadian Mountie and a man on horses and some wagons. And um, this would have been a, a, a fun wallpaper, probably for a child's room or a, a study something like that. And the two pieces on the bottom are interesting. Um, the one on the left, the bottom left, is a border for the top of the wall. And the one on the right um, is a frieze for the bottom of the wall. I don't have an example of what went in between and perhaps it could have just been paint. Um, we don't know, or it could have been another version of this Mickey Mouse pattern. These would have been for a children's room. Um, let's see. This was made by, they were made by Sanderson and Sons, which is still a viable wallpaper company. And they are flocked and hand painted, the two on the bottom. We also see occasions when um, people who are not wallpaper manufacturers at all or, or designers at all uh, may do a wallpaper as we saw with the very first image of Andy Warhol. Um, this wallpaper is called nicotine and was produced by the industrial designer, um, a very new profession at the time, Donald Dusky. He was not a wallpaper designer and when designing an interior, he designed all the elements, furniture, textiles, rugs, and the wallpaper. It hung in a suite of rooms in the men's lounge at Radio City Music Hall, which was built in 1930. And the name of the pattern refers to the images shown um, on the design. A tobacco worker's daily routine, cultivating tobacco, selling the tobacco workers, and I would love to go to New York and see if this is still there. <laughs> it's very interesting. And it um, has an interesting uh, material that is made out of aluminum foil paper. So it would have been shiny um, and probably would have complemented his furnishings, kind of art deco, modern furnishings. During World War II, industrial manufacturers were under a design freeze, enabling them to support the war effort. When the freeze ended in 1945, the wallpaper industry recovered and gained ground. And we see on the right-hand side, 1949, post-war, the United Wallpaper Company is an advertisement showing some of their latest designs that uh, they're hoping that people will buy for their homes. And on the right-hand side, we see images of two interiors, uh, two typical interiors of the time. 
The top one is all pink, pink, pink wallpaper, pink, um, all the accessories and the things that go with it, including the, roof, the uh, radiator on the left. Um, and that would have been a, a, a very stylish, fashionable bathroom. Uh, on the bottom, we see a living room, which has a very subtle pattern, but all the walls are, are pattern or papered with the same pattern. And it's a backdrop for um, a very modern living room with kind of Swedish looking design furniture, um, built in bookcase, bookcases, um, and a fireplace. During the 50s, interior decoration trends changed, but wallpaper remained a popular decorative element of that. Um, we see much more modern furniture um, in the, the one on the left of the 50s interior. There's a surface printed wallpaper. They're used in an unusual way. They're um, put into panels along the wall, the upper part of the wall and the lower part of the wall is um, wood paneling. Um, so this is not an arrangement we'd seen before, but we're beginning to see it during the 50s. And on the right hand side, we have um, a bedroom, um, kind of a ideal bedroom with surface printed papers and the wallpaper panels are um, contem contemporary, very contemporary with mid-century which is the 50s. Um, and then we get back to Andy Warhol. Um, let's see. This wallpaper is an artistic statement, not really a, a wallpaper, um, not meant to um, cover all the walls of a room. It would be pretty overpowering if it did. It's called The Cow. It was designed in 1966. And it's a screen print on vinyl. Um, Andy Warhol was among many 20th century artists who dabbled in wallpaper design. And his work was considered pop art. All of his artistic work was pop art. And he created this pa paper for an exhibition, but it never functioned in the way that wallpapers normally do. Moving on to the 70s, we see very um, bright, dense, colorful designs. Um, an example of a trend here that we see is coordinating high quality wall coverings with matching fabrics. In this e example, for instance, the design of the fabric dictated the design of the wall covering, very busy and colorful. And this is called Jardin, um, it's from the 80s made by uh, Roche, which is a very famous, I think still operating um, German wallpaper, wallpaper company. Now we're getting into our era, the 21st century. Um, whatever term we use today, wallpapers or wall coverings, they are less likely to be made exclusively of paper. They may not have any paper at all in their makeup. The terms are used interchangeably. Vinyl, PVC, and mixtures of these materials with paper are all used to produce wall coverings. Some designers have included non-traditional materials in their wall coverings, such as LED lights to light up the wall, beads, sand, plastics that are embedded in the wall covering surface, um, all of these are included in the fabrication process. So on the right hand side, the left hand side, sorry, we have tangerine and green. This is um, West Elm, an offering from West Elm, which is a very popular interior um, supplier for people, for home buyers. Um, it's a temporary, oh, oh, I'm sorry, it's not final. Um, another West Elm product, Birch Trunks, is a new temporary wall covering. A homeowner or a renter can peel off the temporary backing and apply it to walls. Anticipating a move, the wall covering is easily removed and transported. Um, so, 
that's a modern way to do it. This one is very interesting. This talks about unusual materials, LED lights, embedded objects. In this case, LED lighting. Ingo Maurer uh, was a designer. He died in the last few months, uh, you know, months, years, 2019. He was a German industrial designer who specialized in the design of lamps and light installations. And he was nicknamed the poet of light. Here he's applied his lighting expertise to light up a wall covering um, from within the paper itself. And you can see the reflection of that on the, on the floor. Um, this is not a paper that's available anymore. I would love to see one in person, but um, it's not. So another person who devised um, a way to embed materials in wallpaper for, for wonderful effects was Maya Romanoff. He also passed away recently in 2014. He was the inventor and manufacturer of high-end wall covering products for his company, the Maya Romanoff Corporation. His wall com com coverings continue to be hand manufactured with inclusions such as glass beads, metals, and other materials, creating a dazzling surface on walls. And not only is it dazzling, dazzle with light, but it also has texture that you can feel. So. Okay, and we're still in the 21st century. Um, how are wallpapers used today? Functions old and new. How are they used? Are they used today? Yes, in all the traditional ways, they are still used to introduce style, personality, texture, color, and pattern to interior walls, as we see here. There are also fresh ideas on how to use them as an accent wall, as a lining for a closet, um, or as a background for shelving, as temporary wall decoration, pre-pasted, easily installed and taken down. Designers have used wall coverings as political or cultural statements. There are even wallpapers that invite interaction with and personalization, personalization by the owner. As always, the market for nostalgic historic wallpaper patterns is strong. As a background for antique furniture or traditional architecture, there are still exciting options. And we see that in both of these cases. A contemporary dining room furnished with antiques or reproductions of antiques and a very uh, lovely traditional wallpaper that could have been designed in the 19th century um, and provides a, a very appropriate background for the furnishings. And um, on the lower right, a bedroom with very high style decoration, um, not only in the architecture, but the walls, a very bright blue and white um, accent wall, um, and a mixture with antiques, various kinds. Accents and colorful interiors. So in both of these images, we see wallpaper used as an accent wall, which means they've only done one wall in that room. Um, and people call them statement walls, they call them accent walls, uh, but they can be very effective. Um, and if they're dark, they don't darken the entire room if you only use one. Sometimes people use them behind beds or in this case, as uh, a wall with art hung on it. So, and the kitchen wall covering, we see, um, um, these are both from Walmart. They're sold by Walmart. And um, we see in this kitchen, um, the light fixture is um, mid-century modern light fixture um, or after one, modeled after one. And we see an echo of that 
in the wallpaper um, in green and kind of a cream. And some contemporary uses of wallpaper. We talked about this. We have an accent wall on the far left, um, which sits behind, it will give a background for the person sitting at the desk. Perhaps this is a professional office um, and it can engage the people in the room. Uh, the center one is wallpaper lining a child's bedroom closet. Uh, very pretty. Um, won't be seen when the doors are closed, but that's okay. But it's a way to decorate without decorating the walls. And the one on the left, I'm oh, sorry, the right, all the way on the right, another closet, um, an interior of a closet, probably a coat closet um, on the first floor. So. Sheila Bridges, this is a very interesting example of wallpaper. Some people have um, used cultural and political themes as a source for 21st century wall covering design. The African-American designer, Sheila Bridges, has co-opted the French toile, an 18th century um, French textile tile and wallpaper design motif that illustrated the lives of upper crust white people. Bridges Harlem toile wallpaper illustrates the activities of black Americans. Bridges has said about this design as an Ameri African American living in Harlem, I have always been intrigued and inspired by the historical narrative of the decorative arts, especially traditional French toile and its pastoral mo motifs from the late 1700s. I'm entertained by the stories these patterns tell and the questions they sometimes rise. After searching for many years for the perfect toile for my home, I decided that it simply didn't exist. So she designed her own. Um, and this is a wallpaper that can be used um, just as a background for furnishings in a house. It also contains social and political commentary. Um, it was designed in 2006 by Bridges for studio works. It's screen printed on paper. And it shows scenes of young men playing basketball. There's a couple dancing um, to a boom box and people eating fried chicken and watermelon. And on the, the right hand side is a, um, an example of a French toile from the 19th century. And we see that it's little vignettes of um, people um, enjoying their days, carrying out their activities, um, doing work, playing. And finally, um, we have some interactive wall coverings, which I think are, are fun. A number of 21st century wall co covering companies offer these wall coverings that can be personalized by the owner. Um, gives the resident of the home the opportunity of pur purchasing a virtually blank canvas, which they can personalize in any way that they like. And we see in the left and the, the bottom left, we see two people who are personalizing their wallpaper. Um, we won't know what it all looks like until they're finished. And then on the right-hand side, we see another installation of wallpaper uh, with frames. And the frames are meant to be um, frames for hanging a photo, drawing in, writing text, whatever the homeowner wants to do. Um, so thank you for taking this quick journey through wallpaper history. Wallpaper's popularity as a decorative art has waxed and waned, but today, nearly five centuries after paper was hung on walls, first hung on walls, it continues to hold its own as a colorful decorative addition to many, many homes. And thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. That was fascinating, Elsie. Thank you thank so you. much for such an interesting talk. Yes, and if, um, 
if someone has questions, go ahead and uh, raise your hand on the Zoom, or or you can just you can just jump in. We have um, you can just ask a question or make a comment if you like. Um, and if if Elsie, if you want to stop your screen share, we can show right. people uh, speaking. So so we can. So, Isabel and Molly. so we, we can show people. Okay, I see Isabel Capri and then Molly. Go ahead, Isabel, if you want to unmute. Oh, Isabel, you're muted. Hi. Thank you. Hi. So I really, really enjoyed that. I really Thank enjoyed you. that. And having just a tiny, tiny bit of experience of trying to hang my own wallpaper. Oh my God. It's not something that I'm going to do again in a hurry, but it was just really interesting, the history. And, and I was thinking, so the wood blocks, so, so much time, you know, so, so careful, the focus, the precision, part of that, that, the whole process of, 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 you know, from designing the, 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 the pattern and then, and then getting getting that with color onto paper and so on. And then I think today, so I don't know if, if anyone else that's listened to this talk has ever done uh, any of their own paper, paper coloring, you know, with gel plates and stencils and stamps and acrylic colors and, and just household items that provide different texture and how now today in our own homes, we can make these beautiful uh, paper, you know, mm -hmm. with, with patterns and colors, and then we can collage with them and so on. Yeah. So it's just, um, I'm grateful that we're able to do that, you know, and, and now, um, now having more of an appreciation for how much time and effort went into doing, uh, particularly the, the, the earliest, yes. papers, you know. And there's, there are still companies that do make wallpaper, mostly reproduction wallpaper for historic spaces mm -hmm. um, using the, in, the old methods of design, paper making and um, wood black printing. It's amazing. Yeah, see. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Elsie, that was really interesting. Good, thanks. Okay. Molly. Hi, Molly. Hi, Elsie. Um, I kind of have a comment, not a question, although two comments. First of all, um, we, we've made a lot of paper, you and I, um, <laughs> and I have used it only as wallpaper in tiny houses, not um, my big house. But you've, I've come to, I'm thinking about um, some of the more contemporary things that you mentioned and asking myself, um, and I maybe offline we can talk another time. Sure. What kind of paper I might use um, that would be more durable? You know, maybe it's just the common paper we use in our art. But um, it, you piqued my curiosity. So that is kind of a question that I don't necessarily um, need you to answer for me now. But maybe other people would be interested. But um, it. It, it really does occur to me that, I, that some of the papers I make could very well go on walls in my home instead of um, in the tiny houses I make, so. Yeah, sure, sure, you could do that. Um, you need to make a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as you know, or you may not know, I have made a lot of them. Yes. I'm constantly using them up uh, in small ways, but I yeah. think it would be an interesting project um, depending on whether I could find the right kind of paper. And I've not tried to hang wallpaper myself. Um, I have not. As either. Isabel seems as though she has. <laughs> I, I also, one final thing. I was very interested to see Donald Desky's wallpaper because mm -hmm. I have three pieces of furniture right. that he uh, made um, that were, I think, uh, a an old friend of mine acquired them from an old movie studio that went bankrupt. Wow. And so they're very deco and um, have weathered a long time. 
Um, but yeah. like the, the color of the red, the deep dark red um, in the tobacco wallpaper is pretty much that that's the color of these pieces of furniture they're red leather mm -hmm. and they look just like you'd see a, a, in a movie yes interesting wow i would love to so, see them sometime. well um i i can make that happen <laughs> but thank you very much um this You're was welcome. really fascinating and inspiring thank you Okay, did, did my friend Roy Likes, who is an interior designer, want to add a comment? I'm going to just, if you want to unmute. Roy has done interior design for some of the rich and famous. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a nine room home here in Silver Spring, and I have wallpaper in eight of the nine rooms. Wow. in one place or another. Sometimes it's trim, sometimes it's a whole room, sometimes it's a dado uh, below a chair rail, mm -hmm. uh, but I have, I have used wallpaper very generously for myself and for many <laughs> well-known clients in Bethesda, Potomac, Chevy Chase and Northwest DC. Including really? Nancy Pelosi. Oh, <laughs> Nancy is my favorite. Wow. I'm impressed. That's wonderful. Yeah. So you're a hanger? Is that right? A paper hanger? No, no, no. I'm I'm an interior designer. But oh, I'm retired I'm now. I'm retired now. Wonderful. Well, we should have a conversation sometime. <laughs> That's wonderful. I can connect you guys through email. Okay. Good to see you, Roy. Was Good there? See you, and I saw yeah. your mother there too. Yeah, she's here with me watching. Say hello. Hi, Roy. Hello. We're in San Diego <laughs> together. Oh, great. <laughs> but I'm coming back Friday. Good. Everybody's worried. Me. We missed you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was curious. Um, so I. I thought China had the first wallpaper. Is that just, uh, I, I've read about that, that China may have had some of the earliest wallpaper. Um, and could you also speak about earlier wall coverings what people use such as tesserae tiles, uh, which go back centuries really. They do. You know, thousands of years. Yes, they do. Um, the idea of China, the Chinese inventing wallpaper, I've heard it, I've read it, I've, but it, I have not ever seen it confirmed. Um, they definitely invented paper and spread that throughout the entire world. But uh, wallpaper, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think so. Um, they may have produced papers to hang on walls in the ways that the dominoes were used. Um, it would be fun to research that and, and find out more about it, but I, I don't think that that's correct. And other wall coverings, um, I love stenciled walls. There's been lots of stenciling um, in, over the centuries. Leather is used to cover walls, embossed leather, um, certainly uh, mosaics. I, I am not an expert on all the other wall coverings, but um, fabrics, some, and people still do that. They install fabric on their wall, which looks like wallpaper, but it's fabric. Um, so I, I wish I had more information about that. Right. I guess I guess cave drawings would have been the very first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Great. Yes. Well, who else um, had a question or comment for Elsie? I have a lot of folks here and I saw another hand going up. Did someone else? Uh, we have time for one more, one or two more questions, comments. Isabel? I, I missed, what, um, I, I missed what, what was said just a minute ago. So 
Um, Elsie, you, you're not convinced that, um, that China invented wallpaper. You know, there's just not enough evidence for that. But, but when did they invent paper? Did you think it was, I think it was in the talk, like 600, very, very early. Okay. Um, and then they spread it to um, the Moors, I believe. Yeah. 100 BC, I just looked it up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Wow. Um, and then it got, it, the, then it was spread throughout Europe. Yeah, thank so. you. Great. All right. Well, any, um, we, I, I would love to invite you back to do a talk on furniture too, the history of furniture. I see that that's in your bio. Yeah. So oh. don't be surprised. <laughs> and I, I know, uh, Elsie, through tiny house building class and paper and um, mixed media with Marcy Wolf Hubbard. And um, Molly is one of our fellow classmates. And Maureen. And Maureen, yes, Maureen. There's like layers, there's a few more. Who else had, did someone else have a question or comment before we close? Well, okay. thank you You were much. so thorough. <laughs> well, it was so great, Elsie. Thank you. I could have yes. told you so much more, but um, it's, it's yes. a fun topic. It's really fun to work with. Yeah. It was It was a very fascinating topic. We enjoyed it very much. So thank you everyone for joining us for a wallpaper and a ephemeral Thank you art. very much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Elsie. <laughs> everyone have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Molly. Bye. I'll